Well, good evening, everybody. I am Mia Mason, and I am glad to be here with you and John Queen. Uh, we're going to have a simple conversation about what is going on in America this week. It is disheartening, and it's worth talking about. So, John, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, first, I would like to say thank you for having me and allowing me to uh, have this conversation with you on your platform. It's a great honor. And I thank you very much for that privilege. Um, my name is John Queen. I'm president and co-founder of the Bayside Hoyas Youth Organization. Hoyas being the acronym for Helping Our Youth Achieve Success. Uh, we started this program on the Eastern Shore in 2013. And we've grown to where at one time we were at actually programming for 250 youth directly on the shore. And that looks anything from civic responsibility the team building, leadership development, uh, college preparation, and things of that nature. So we're trying to be a, a resource in our community and try to help a lot of youth uh, move forward in life and be productive. Wow. So you're definitely a grassroots organization. I'm yes, a grassroots campaign. And you talked about leadership. How important is that for an organization to influence others, especially our youth? Well, leadership is is one of those intangibles that is giving, giving out light. Um, in order to be a leader, you must embody certain qualities of a leader and leadership. For someone like myself who deals with the community every day and actually work with the youth every day, leadership is something that they can aid as authentic and something that they can put trust into. Um, a lot of times we let the youth know that our word is our word. If we're going to offer you help, that help doesn't come with a condition. That help is unconditional. We like to meet the youth where they are at, and then once we meet them where they are, we like to also teach them how to lead because a lot of times in the program we've developed where a lot of the kids who've been around are the leaders. They're the ones that bring the kids now. They're the ones that go and talk about the program, and it gives them a sense of self-worth that they have embodied and put into this program. So leadership is one of those qualities that I think is very important, not only at the local level, but even at the national level. Leadership is something that's very underestimated. Understood. So I've replaced a lot of bad leaders, and often it takes moral courage to do that. What would yes. you say is your definition of that moral courage? Moral courage is sometimes it's, it's on the eye of the beholder, so to speak. It's what your values are and your principles are, but how they affect other people. Because a lot of people have morals. That it's just been your experience in life where you might feel that you're doing great things and your character is good, but those outcomes might have uh, a lack of empathy towards other people or put people in a position to be offended or feel like it's condescending. You have to always be careful about when using a word like moral and that moral compass word, how you affect other people's life and is it better off after the interaction with you as it pertains to being moral. I completely agree. And when we are looking at what makes a good leader and a bad leader, we have to reflect on what our current situations are. You know, yes. we have to be able to look at the decisions some leaders have made. And right. we're going to be talking about uh, the Breonna Taylor decision. You know, basically, here's some background on that. On March 13th, police used a no-knock warrant to knock down the door of a medical worker, their home, on bad information and shot uh, and killed Breonna Taylor. There's a lot of evidence out there that, you know, is basically kind of flabbergasting to me because she was still in bed. Right. You know, and then in the days of the courts of Louisville, they decided not to charge the officer with her death. You know, uh, actually with what happened at the doorway because it was basically entering. Uh, right. We have more respect for international laws not to go into Osama bin Laden's home for nearly a year, but we <laughs> provide a no-knock warrant just to go get someone in the middle of the night. 
right. I'm, I'm, as a veteran, that really hurts because we respect more international laws than we do state and local laws. And I would like to first get your reaction to that decision and the overall situation that I've described here. Yes. Because it, it actually focuses on the issues that, you know, I feel that it's racism. You know, yes. I feel that they knew who was in that house mm -hmm. and they didn't care. They were making noise and then they just went in. And these right. are some of the same issues that we face every day in the black community. So let's hear from you. What do you think about yeah. this? For, uh, at the decision, I will say that one, I'm insulted. Because I think America as a whole has played on the intelligence of the black community for far too long. But am I surprised? No, I am not. I'm, I'm, I can't be surprised. Um, something like this, because someone died, I like to try to not talk from opinion and try to just get facts. So let's say if we just listened to what the attorney general said and we believed everything he said, which I don't. This happened March 13th, and something is just now happening, and that has a lot to do with the uprising of social injustice across the nation. They had no plans of vindicating that young woman's death or appeasing her family. So when you look at the attorney general, we have to look at weak black leaders in America right now. Someone who's a buffer between systemic racism in the black community. We have a responsibility and a role to play as it pertains to our community and how we allow people to not only infiltrate but affect our community. And a state, that state has a no knock warrant rule, a law. But it also has a stand your ground law and it also has a, a, a license to carry law. You put these three components together, it's dangerous. So if, if I'm asleep and someone in plain clothes, plain clothes, no badge, no police sirens, you snuck in my yard and you knock my door down while I am sleeping and I have a right to protect me and my family, you can't blame that person for drawing a fire. Now, whatever happened once these firearms got to going off, it's been too many inconsistencies in the police report that does not point to the evidence. And as a black person, the drywall that the bullets went through has more rights than my black life. That's alarming to me that the police was charged with the bullets that missed the woman, not the bullets that killed her. I also look at the fact that they gave a $12 million settlement for wrongful death charge no one in a wrongful death. So when you look at these type of layers and intangibles, you start to really question how valuable my life is to this society and to this country. It's, it's disheartening on a level where, once again, let's give the Attorney General the benefit of the doubt. He spoke from 100% facts. And we look at this as an unfortunate circumstance. Marcus Gardner, George Floyd, Anton Black, Tamir Rice, Trayvon Martin. We as a black I'm community, right. yeah. we're tired. We don't know what justice looks like, and we don't know what justice feels like, and we're tired. So social media has put this into a perspective where everyone can see what someone like myself has lived, lived for 42 years. You're starting to see this now, and you're starting to understand that it's not as good as we thought in this country. So it's just a, it's just a terrible thing all across the board. I, I have to completely agree with you. It pisses me off, you know, that this is going to continue to happen if this administration just like keeps yes. going after our communities. You know, I came from Portsmouth, Virginia. I grew up, you know, in a very diverse community. You know, I loved everyone. You know, I yes. cared for everyone. I gave everybody the proper due diligence up front, you know? Yes. And now it's just like, you see what's going on and it's like, you have to choose a side. And I'm like, no, 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 no. 
we are together in this, folks. Correct. We have to work together in this. Police reform Correct. has to happen. You know, the, like you said, give the AG the benefit of the doubt. But my gosh, he is like Obi-Wan Kenobi. From a certain point of view, you know, murder happened. But Correct. because we paid out, we don't need to charge anybody. And right. because they retired or whatever else, we don't need to do anything further. They're going to yes. swipe it under the rug, and we can't allow that to happen. We have to honestly get rid of some of this qualified immunity when they're in plain clothes and sneaking into people's houses. I yes. mean, people get swatted playing video games still. Correct. And Eating that ice is cream. Yes, correct. It's, it's, so to the police reform thing, to me personally, I think police reform at a local level is a joke. Dude, in order to look at police reform and, and undo some of the systemic racism, we have to first look at undoing what slavery was intended to do. We have to start there before we worry about these other things. When you think of slavery, things like bondage, enslavement, servitude comes to mind. We must undo these aspects in our community first. You can't ask a police, local police department, to conform or reform when the FBI, on record, has said they've done things to uh, 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 systematically disrupt black communities. We have to go higher up the chain and start looking at some of these policies and some of these laws. And to be honest, we have to first look at the Constitution and the amendments and start going through that and reform that. If we're going to reform something, let's reform our Constitution. Because if you're black in America, you haven't even received the amendment 13 through 15 yet. So at what time period are we going to receive equity, equality, and justice? So for me, I think a level of reform is needed. Um, there's a study that shows, if I'm not mistaken, that police who are hired with who are hired with a college education has a dramatically less chance of having these type of reports filed on them. So we need to definitely look at those type of things. We also need to look at how many hours go into this training? You go to barber school longer than you go to be a police officer. Exactly. It's mind boggling. True. It's mind boggling. Um, and we also have to look at how police officers were formed. The original reason they were formed was for plantation, plantation overseer, paddy rovers. So they're doing exactly what the Constitution and what the laws state that they are doing. Their job is to protect and serve white America and the white society. Not the immigrants, not the people who were brought over here for servitude. So when you talk reform, you have to go deep into it and not just scratch at the surface with more foot patrols or more visual police. The police in the inner cities are predominantly white police. Why is that? Why is that? We have to question things deeper than the surface level, in my opinion. That's a great opinion. And I have to say that, you know, we have passed the Equal Rights Amendment to help probably change the Constitution to Correct. bring the Civil Rights Act up to the federal national level for everyone to make sure that we fight for that equity, fight for that freaking equality that we honestly deserve. It is a right to have not a privilege and it shouldn't be taken away because I walked on the wrong side of the street or I sat in the wrong place and you didn't like me by the way I looked or who I am by my identity, sex or color or right. nation of origin or religion. I, yes. you know, we have to be able to make sure that this happens. If you wanted to do something and work on this policy, because it's going to come back to the house, what would you want to add on the national level to make sure the ERA you know, gets to help everyone. What would be your one or two lines in there that would say, yeah. we need this now? Well, I, I know a little bit about that law that's trying to get passed, but I, I want to separate everything you said, because I agree with that 100% and kind of keep it on what the focus should be in America right now. 
and that's oppression on blacks. But we need specific support, not ambiguous and not in general to help us out. Now, to everything you said, uh, because certain certain agendas or certain oppressed areas might get overshadowed if everyone's allowed in the swimming pool. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's not necessarily, you know, what can happen. That's not the version of equity or equality we are looking for if everyone had a uh, swimming pool, like you said. So, so let's go down to the local level. And, you know, I was recently asked a lot about Chestertown, the Black Lives mural, and yes. a, a policy that is coming through, um, you know, about racial progress on the shore. Yes, ma'am. Can, can you uh, tell us about how a little town of 5,000 people is making this leap forward uh, to, to change how we think, how we're taught? how yes. to work with diversity and restore that equity and equality. Yes, well, it, it, it came about um, pretty much like a lot of these movements, these grassroots movements are coming along now where I think the George Floyd situation was a tipping point when everyone started to say, what can we do and how can we do it? Um, so you mentioned the murals. That's a great symbolic uh, thing to give or intangible to give to the community. But the hopes are that those murals go into bigger things uh, because it doesn't address anything systemic. So what happened actually was during this uh, debate, because it was a heated debate of what goes on with the mural and whether or not it would be allowed, I challenged Chris Arino because he and I are friends. And after all of this was going on, I felt like he didn't understand how insensitive he came off to people who actually genuinely know him and know that's not what he meant. So he and I started having conversations. Um, I can't speak to anyone else in who he spoke to, but with me, I start challenging him as a leader. I start making him understand that his life and my life are completely different. We have a lot of things in common, Chris and myself, but I started to challenge him in his role as the mayor in giving us action. Because once they adopted uh, Black Lives Matter as government speech and then created Chestertown Unites Against Racism, I told him he has to think about everyone now, but he has to garner support to a certain demographic to help us being uh, oppressed. Now, his 16-month plan, I think is beautiful. I think it's a landmark for social justice, not just on the shore, but possibly for the state of Maryland, if needed on that level. He has uh, unification, legislation, and education as his three pillars, and each pillar breaks down into several components that are geared and built towards wide community input. One of the things that people were upset about with murals is they felt like the black community wasn't involved and enough people were not at the table. To his credit, Mayor Chris Serino heard that and he said, how can we as a town, as a council, as a community involve everyone and bring everyone perspective to the table? And I think the Chestertown Unites Against Racism 16 month plan definitely embodies that right there. Great, because you know, if it starts in Chestertown, it will go to the next county, it will go to yes. the state. It will go yes. to other counties around this nation, and hopefully yes. we can freaking, you know, save our country before it gets destroyed, you know, on election day. I think this will actually help because we understand that, for me, I watch a militarized police force roll down the street, and I'm like, why the F do they need that? Where are right. they going? Are they going to a trailer park? where we have below level income and poverty happening, right. yeah, that's where they're going. They think right. that's where the big data is and everything is happening. These people are trying to work three to four jobs just to afford what they have. Right. You know, we understand that this is real. We have to admit that there is a problem. We have to make yes. sure that we can now implement a plan and yes. that as leaders, we set the example and we march forward with it 
so that it can become national. Correct. I think that is the correct thing to do. If not, we may have to start over again. And just like any other bill, it comes with an idea. It comes with a spark. Correct. Yeah. But I yes. don't want to see somebody else die with being choked out or shot in their bedroom by us not doing anything to actually fix the problem at the level where it should have been corrected before they Correct. were even hired. Yes, and, and one thing I actually appreciate and like about your campaign is the grassroots feel to it. That's the most important part of any movement because that makes it organic and it makes it inclusive. It brings a lot of people to the table knowing that once you affect your neighborhood, your town, your city, you know it gets contagious and to your point, it grows to where it can consume several entities, organizations, stakeholders, and businesses where everyone can be involved because everyone was involved from the inception of these type of plans, laws. Also at the grassroots level, I think we need to understand our power. We elect these officials and we don't hold them accountable. A lot of officials or politicians, whatever the word a lot of people want to use, aren't held accountable once they get into office. They'll stand in front of you and shake hands and kiss babies, and the minute they're in office, they forget about every platform they ran on. And we as a community don't hold them accountable. So many people in the last local election ran unopposed here in Chester Town. And so many people are complaining about what they're giving us as politicians and elected leaders. You have to hold them accountable. You have to say you ran on a better education system, so then there's no reason our education system is bottom third in the state. Yeah. You have to say you ran on economic development, then there's no reason the youth here leave to find jobs and never come back and give to this community. So on the grassroots level, we have to understand one our power and our influence, and we have to always hold these politicians, not just politicians, community organizations as well, with committees and commissions. People who speak for the community have to be held accountable. And speak for me if you have never spoken to me. So we have to be mindful of our power at the grassroots level. And like I said, that's one of the things I really like about your campaign is that natural, organic, grassroots feel. Thank you. Thank you. Because honestly, like, I have to hold myself accountable. You know, I yes. have to look myself in the mirror and say, are, are you happy today with what you're doing? If not, I have to go accomplish something. And, Correct. and, and that's what leadership will do. You know, like, I yes. can be a manager and tell people to do this and do that. But that's more of like being a business owner and an employee of that business. You know, Correct. and we need to be able to help a lot of other people. So me being held accountable to say, yes, we're going to help the economics, we're going to help this, we're going to help that, that means I pick up the phone, I call those local people, yes. I call the SBA, you know, yes. I talk to right. nonprofit organizations like yourself so that you actually have a platform like here today to share that message, to yes. get that notification out there to say, hey, we're doing this together, we want you to come and help us because that duplication really matters. It makes my life a lot easier, makes your life a lot easier. It's a win-win. Everybody in the community succeeds, and it, 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 it's going to help you. We yes. know that. And right. we have to be able to provide that opportunity now and today because we are suffering, not only on the racial level, but the economic, the environmental. Yes. And we have to be able to achieve this. And, yes. it, you know, hey, from Somerset up to Kent County, all the way to Carroll County, there are African American communities out there that are completely underserved and they see that they're in a minority. Honestly, we're moving into that neighborhood and the African American community is our neighbor. Right. And I'm, you know, if you kick out more white people, I'm, you've done the right thing. Yes. They were probably bad apples. Yes, and, and, and not even to, to your point, right now the country is overrised with black and white. Yeah. But someone like myself at the grassroots level, I deal with black, 
brown, white, who all suffer from low social economic conditions. Yeah. We have to be able to address all people, all colors, all genders, religions, everything must be encompassed. When you say the word help, it shouldn't come with a condition on it. I'm not, I'm gonna help you, but I'm only gonna help you because of the color of your skin. I'm only gonna help you because of who you vote for. Help is unconditional. Help and love go hand in hand. How can you help me if you have no love for me, my culture, my history, my education? How can you help me if you don't have love for who I am as a person? So I think right now, because it's so pulverizing with black and white, we're forgetting the Hispanic and the lower social economic whites who are poor and who go through the same oppression as everyone else. Yeah. And because statistically, more white people are on SNAP. They're on WIC. They're on benefits. They're more yes. disabled. And the thing is, is that if we cut out the ACA, we cut away their Medicare, you know, that means they have nothing. They're, yes. they're, they're hurt. And yes. I have to go back to my roots where I came from in Portsmouth, Virginia, and see what that hope looked like. I. I remember listening to the radio and I'm like, like, who is this? I've heard that voice before, you know, and I'm thinking, you know, like, okay, I'd get my radio out, listening to 103, 102, 104, and I'm like, Missy Elliot, who is this? She grew up <laughs> in my hometown. And then we had Nicole yes. Ray, who was a couple of years behind her, grow up and you know, they fought. They were grassroots. They yes. were out there selling cassette tapes anywhere that they walked. Yes. And you hear them, and even though that, you know, Nicole moved over to Norfolk, it, it's still her hometown. It's still my hometown. Yes. And, and we have to take those roots and make that lineage come through the Eastern Shore. Understand yes. that this is what grassroots does. We create right. that underground railroad. We fight that oppression. Mm -hmm. We show people mm -hmm. how to become stars, mentors, and leaders. Correct. I think that is, you know, what your organization is able to do when someone says yes and they listen. You know, yes. and we need folks to be able to reach out to you to provide you more resources. How do they yes. get a hold of you? They get a hold of me two ways, well, several ways. So, Bayside Hoyas, we have a website, Bayside Hoyas, that's B A Y S I D E H O Y A S dot org. You go there, that's our website. But also, if you type that in your Google, Google search, we're the first three pages. And we're on all social media platforms. You can also email us at Bayside Hoyas 2013 at gmail.com we are a non-profit so resources donation support partnerships all help us a lot of our donations not because this is non-profit i'm the president not executive director so everything people see me do i do for free okay i have to say i don't want to get paid but 95 percent of our donations go directly to the community directly to programming and directly to resources to help facilitate some of the voids in our community. I completely agree with you and I'm glad that you're doing this because you know I like to I, they tell me I have to put a chip on my shoulder someday and I'm like yeah I guess I'll start doing it. I did my campaign <laughs> all by myself. Right. right. I was so lucky that once I won the primary that people came to us and said, how can we help you? How can we defeat this man and do this? And so like, we kind of duplicate what I do yes. and, and make it happen. And it's just yes. like any nonprofit, this is how it gets started. So Correct. folks, it, if you want to help John, you can also help me, all right? It's help going to both. benefit the entire community. And it's just not the Eastern Shore we're talking about. We're talking about the whole state of Maryland. If we can right. duplicate what we're doing in Chestertown to stop what's happening in, in Louisville, you know, we can get it done together. That's yes. the point of this conversation is we're here together to help you to become yes. with us together as a family. So Correct. make sure that you join us at miadmason.us. You can follow me at Mia4MD. 
And of course, this is a candidate who actually answers the phone, 41094 Mason. So John, any closing remarks you want to give to our community before we get out of here? I would just like to thank you one once again for giving me this platform to articulate not only about my program, but about current social issues in the country and in our state and local level. Um, I just want to tell everyone out there, when you talk grassroots, that keyword is community, and unity is in community. We have to start working together, being transparent and giving comprehensive plans and solutions. No more complaining. It's time for action. And a lot of this that we're talking about today needs action. The lip service has ran its course, and we need to have real change. And in order to do that, we must provide action. So once again, I thank you for this platform, and I thank you for reaching out. Thank you, John. And like he said, we're done with thoughts and prayers. It's put on your sneakers, join us, go door to door, make phone calls. Let's get it done. Let's make the legislation and the judicial system work for us before we get banned or turned into property tonight. So join us, and let's make sure that everyone gets supported in our communities. Have a great night. Bye, everybody.